welcome to certainly the biggest event of the Rockfish Valley Foundation uh, in 2011. We had three events scheduled in 2020. We canceled them all and went virtual. So let's, let's hope we'll be doing some events uh, along with more Zooms, more geology Zooms, but also on water, plants, and animals in addition to rocks. While you all can still see people, I will point out on the top row of my screen, Chuck Bailey, can you kind of signal who you are, where you are? There's Chuck, uh, Callan, uh, Bentley. Uh, we've got two professors. Uh, Chuck is our uh, man of the day. So I will be introducing him, but he runs a geology department. At William and Mary and has been bringing students into Nelson County. Callan has taken over from Lawrence Tize. Uh, Lawrence, can you raise your hand? And Callan is now chair of geology action at PVCC. Uh, we have a former chair of our committee, uh, Kate Humphrey. Uh, Kate, can you raise your hand? Uh, we've actually got 11 members of our geology committee. Uh, we've got uh, Chuck, we've got Lawrence, we've got Kate, we've got Callan, we've got Michael Lachance, who's a trustee. Can you raise your hand, Michael? There you are. Uh, Ruth, are you still on? Where's Ruth? Don't see you in my picture. Oh, there you are. So Ruth Dyke has raised her hand. Uh, Deb Markham, are you on this front? There's Deb Markham. She's got her hand up. And one person not here yet is Chip Morgan. And I have to tell you that Chip Morgan was a founding trustee of RVF and was the inspiration about getting us into geology. He introduced us to David Spears. We ended up having David as a great early friend of the foundation. Uh, he has done many of our uh, deliverables. Uh, you will see his work at the Camille kiosk. He also introduced us to his son, Evan, who became our first uh, intern. Uh, Evan is now in the state park system. So we've got this wonderful committee and thank you, Lawrence, for, for being its chair. Me. Oh, the most important member of the committee is sitting to my right, my wife, Betsy, who has, in essence, been responsible for our Natural History Center exhibit. And she is a very straightforward person. And we are so lucky that uh, Chuck Bailey and his wife, uh, Jennifer are going to be in the valley for a few days and Betsy is latching on to Chuck to go down to the Natural History Center for more education and design. So uh, without further ado, he's going to discuss uh, some ongoing and past research in Nelson, new research by women Mary geologists in Nelson. He's going to be talking about the newly opened Blue Ridge Tunnel, the Rockfish Valley Fault, which wasn't even discovered uh, until uh, we came to Nelson County. He's gonna be talking about Nelsonite, which would not even be the state rock if it weren't for our chairman, Lawrence Taze and his PVCC folks. Uh, he's gonna be talking about soapstone, uh, the Nelson County watersheds, there's gonna be good time for questions and answers. Uh, we've said we're gonna be here up to two hours. Uh, if we fade out, we're still gonna be around for anybody who wants to, to keep up the, the cordiality. Uh, so I now want to uh, turn it over. Uh, Chuck Bailey, uh, resident of Williamsburg. We haven't got him as a voting member of Nelson County, but that too uh, might come. So Chuck, welcome. All right, thank you. If you guys can hear me, just give me a thumbs up. Hopefully uh, my voice is going out there. Great, well, I am uh, delighted to be here. I'm gonna share my screen 
And uh, hopefully you'll get to see what we're gonna do over the next sort of half an hour, 40 minutes or so. And I am excited uh, about all these things uh, that are gonna happen in Nelson. And Peter, I appreciate that kind introduction. Um, so hopefully you now see the title slide in which it says Nelson County's Geologic Heritage. I see a few familiar faces on my screen. So if you're seeing my screen, thumbs up again, please. All right, I got a thumbs up, that's good. I'm uh, actually going to uh, turn on the laser pointer and hopefully the laser pointer will work. Uh, that's a blue laser pointer and it is slowly trolling around the title. So hopefully that'll help guide us a little bit as we carry on. I'm in Williamsburg. It's 43 degrees here in Williamsburg. The sunshine is out and my hound dog is in the backyard um, gallivanting around. So if you hear wayward hound dog noises, that is where it's coming from. So let's take a look at this picture um, to start with. This is a photo I took from Willis Mountain in Buckingham County. And it actually is a view into Nelson County. And some of you may recognize some of the geographic features here. So some of you could even be on Devil's Knob uh -huh. at Wintergreen taking in the uh, presentation. If you're actually on Three Ridges taking in this presentation, kudos to you. You probably have some good bandwidth on the Appalachian Trail up there. There are uh, lower mountains here uh, in the midground, and then obviously much flatter terrain as you get further that way. And these are regions that you probably all know about. Um, the Blue Ridge and the Piedmont, they are major sort of landscape regions in Virginia. But I wanna pose a question, and this is part of how the talk is gonna go today. I'm gonna throw questions out there at you. I'll answer some of them, and I'll probably wander off topic on others, but um, hopefully it'll be sort of a, a good way to, to, to move through this presentation. Where does the Piedmont end? Um, it's clear that I'm standing in the Piedmont looking towards the mountains, but where does the Piedmont actually end or the Blue Ridge begin? Um, maybe you can think about where you're taking this presentation in today. Are you in the Blue Ridge or the Piedmont? So how are we going to uh, sort of address that? Well, I think one great way to do that is to look at a map. And what I've got projected right now is a shaded relief map of effectively Nelson County and uh, the surrounding terrain as well. And these maps are sort of the closest thing I can ever do to creating something that looks like art. They can be colorful, they have patterns, they're oftentimes fun to look at. So the colors that you can see um, tell us something about the elevation. So the lower elevations are in gray, you get into intermediate elevations and sort of the greens and the yellows, and then higher elevations um, as you certainly move into the Blue Ridge Mountains in oranges and reds. And then the very highest peaks are sitting up here in white. They may have a little white snow on them today still. So there's a lot we can see with the landscape here. And if everyone had a, a copy of this at home, you could draw your own boundary. This is where the Blue Ridge starts and this is where the Piedmont begins. Well, here is one way to draw that boundary. Um, with the Blue Ridge Mountains occupying this region in here. And the Blue Ridge sort of stands apart from the Shenandoah Valley to the west. And then if we think about what is out to the east of it, broadly considered to be the Piedmont. But one of the things I suggested uh, a number of years back is that there is this sort of region between the Piedmont and the Blue Ridge that is somewhat transitional. And I call this the foothill subregion. And so the ragged mountains near Charlottesville, uh, Horseshoe Mountain, which is not far from the Rockfish Valley, Tobacco Row Mountain down in Amherst County, these are all truly the foothills, um, but have traditionally by geographers been called part of the Piedmont. So that's one way to classify it. But you could also take a turn and classify this as a geologic province. And if you're gonna think about it from a geologic perspective, the Blue Ridge really spans the width of Nelson County. So we can start out here actually in, in Augusta County and then all the way to really the far eastern edges of uh, Nelson would be part of the Blue Ridge. And let me explain how um, that holds together. And to do that, let's visit a fine and lovely location um, along the Blue Ridge Parkway. We're gonna go to the Greenstone Overlook and here you can see a posse of uh, structural geology students from William Mary that are on this outcrop. And what's exciting about this is this is very much truth in advertising. It's called the Greenstone Overlook, and it is a place where one can find greenstone. That is what is enthralling all of these William Mary students. And that greenstone is part of the Catoctin Formation, which is a major geologic unit in much of Virginia. And it's a greenstone, another 
thing you could say about it is it, it actually originated as a basalt, an igneous rock, a volcanic rock that was later metamorphosed. And what we can see along the Blue Ridge Parkway um, in Nelson as well are these ancient lava flows. And they crystallized, that have roared out and flowed over planet Earth a long time ago, 550 million years ago or so. And these rocks are uh, a distinctive unit. And you can actually trace the Catoctin Formation for considerable distance. Um, so humpback rocks underlain by the Catoctin Formation, rockfish gap underlain by the Catoctin Formation. If you continue northward into Shenandoah National Park, much of the high ground there is underlain by the Catoctin Formation. And we can continue along that same belt of rock all the way into, uh, well, Harper's Ferry, Maryland, and even Southern Pennsylvania. But take a look here, it wraps back around and it's originally named for exposures at Catoctin Mountain, Maryland. And we can follow that belt all the way to the south, beyond Culpeper, back to Charlottesville, and then a thin sliver of it comes all the way down into Nelson County. So that is the extent of the Catoctin Formation. And it is exposed this way because it has been arched into a grand fold called the Blue Ridge Anaclinorium. So in this particular uh, cross section, which hopefully you're seeing right now, we have the Catoctin Formation, which is illustrated over here um, near Charlottesville. And we also have the Catoctin Formation exposed uh, on the west limb, which is by and large um, where Shenandoah National Park is, the Blue Ridge Parkway. And in your mind's eye, I want you to visualize at one point, this was a vast and enormous fold structure. And so we can connect rocks of similar origin and age on both sides of the Blue Ridge. So that's why it holds together as a geological province. There are very similar rocks on one side of Nelson County as there are on the other. All right, I wanna take you on a tour today. And this tour is gonna involve literally uh, places and points in uh, uh, all corners of Nelson County. It's not gonna be a, an extensive tour. I'm not gonna cover everything, um, but we're gonna talk about some of this stuff. So I'd like to start at Spy Rock out here in the Blue Ridge, in the mountains, high terrain in the Western part of the county. And Spy Rock is a, a granitic ball. It's a great place to go get a view of the landscape. It's very close to the Appalachian Trail. Um, it's one of those things that we, it used to be very much off the grid. Nobody knew about it much, um, but it's been discovered. In fact, uh, the way you used to get there was to hike up from the Montebello Fish Hatchery, but I think it was sort of overloved and you've got to come to Spy Rock by a variety of ways now. I first got to know Spy Rock when I was a, a counselor at Nature Camp in Vesuvius, Virginia. And what we would do is hike up there with about a case of beer and we'd sit on that outcrop and we would basically talk about the geology, we would talk about the botany, and uh, it was very invigorating um, to sort of think about, you know, the ecology, the landscape, and the connections between different parts of the Earth system. So if you've not been to Spy Rock before, I encourage you to try to find a way to get there. It's a really fabulous location. The rocks you will see there are, are very coarse grained, they're very distinctive. Um, and in fact, what we're looking at there are variable types of granite. Um, and in the image that hopefully you can see, there are these large grains of felspar, there's finer grain interlocking texture of this blue quartz. And this is an igneous rock. And these igneous rocks formed uh, at great depth in the Earth's crust, and they formed a long time ago. In fact, we call it the basement complex because structurally, these rocks would have been below all the other rocks. And we also know that they crystallized, turned to stone literally, over a billion years ago. And they form a suite of rocks that are among the oldest in Virginia. So uh, that's what you'll see if you go to Spy Rock. Um, but I'd like to think about kind of the present, not necessarily a billion years ago. This is uh, my sort of schematic cross section of Spy Rock in the present. And I'm very proud of myself. I drew some herbs on here and some forests that you can see. Um, and it is a place where the soil is not there, all right? We have bare bedrock, but if you wander down the slope, you'll eventually end up on soils that have rich Appalachian forests growing out of them. So the question I pose to you out there in Zoom land is how and when did Spy Rock form? We know the rocks are a billion years old there, but that landform has not been around for a billion years for a variety of reasons. And so you may be sitting there in your living room or your pantry thinking about, hmm, how old is it? And why and how did it form? And these are not necessarily easy questions to answer. 
Um, so another way to frame this, and this is a, a way um, that I think it has value. Let's imagine we came back to Spy Rock at some point in the future. And I think we kind of have two choices here. If we came back in the future, maybe what we would find is the outcrop shrinks. It slowly is covered with forests and there are many more herbs and we do not find uh, the bedrock as sort of voluminous as we see today. Or maybe it could be the other way around. Maybe over time, the outcrop will expand and it will become a much larger, more expansive piece of the Earth's crust that we can see. So this is one of the things that's not easy to do um, in, a, in a setting like this. Um, but you could talk at home about, is it growing? Is it shrinking? Is it in some kind of steady state? Um, because to me, these are interesting questions to ask about the landscape. Is a landform growing, shrinking? Is it uh, got any longevity on the landscape? And how in the world did we form this um, structure in the first place? So Spy Rock is, is one of these spectacular locations in Nelson County where you can see things like this, which are, uh, you know, for the geologist, uh, a source of lots of interesting debate. Okay, let's move to the very northern part of the county. Let's head off to Rockfish Gap. And Rockfish Gap has long been a very important geographic destination. It's about the lowest place um, on the crest of the Blue Ridge for hundreds of miles. Obviously, uh, the transportation network um, since time out of mind has gone over and under Rockfish Gap. Here is a, a map from 1862. And what you can see on here, hopefully, is uh, says Rockfish Gap. And it also says Afton Station, which was basically built as they constructed the railroad up into what became a tunnel below Rockfish Gap. Now here's one of my pet peeves. And one of my pet peeves, and this is the only sort of wonky animation I have, is please call it Rockfish Gap. Don't call it Afton Mountain, all right? The gap is the low part of the ridge. That's why the interstate goes through there, 250. Um, Afton Mountain, it's not really a thing. Um, and so for those in the know, let's call it Rockfish Gap. In fact, I'm quite certain that back in the day, Claudius Crozet only called it Rockfish Gap. Now, 2020 and now even 2021 has been a difficult year, but I tried to take inspiration from Claudius Crozet and his mutton chop sideburns. So I have been working, much to the chagrin of people in my house, to uh, emulate Claudius and uh, his look. And I think he wears it a little better than I do. So Claudius was responsible for designing, engineering the tunnel underneath Rockfish Gap. And back when I was in high school in Crozet, I spent a fair bit of time taking beers up to the tunnel and sneaking in there. But um, as a 16, 17 year old drinking a beer, going into a tunnel, which is cold and clammy, is, is uh, kind of counterproductive, although you were certainly out of harm's way there. So I never thought that I would come back to encounter the tunnel, but um, we started collaborating with the, the Crozet Tunnel Foundation. And in 2017, with uh, my, uh, we Mary students, we started a project to better understand the geology of the tunnel. So here you can see a photo from the tunnel back in 2017. And the interior of the tunnel that time was primarily blocked off by what I would affectionately call a concrete wafer. And this is my student, Katie Lang, who did her senior thesis trying to map in detail the geology inside the Blue Ridge Tunnel. To access the deep interior at that time, one had to crawl through these pipes. And the whole story there is that um, there was a plan hatched um, after this tunnel was closed to store natural gas in the inside. So they basically walled up two sides of it and there were little pipes to get into the middle. And these pipes are scary and I am so delighted that they have been removed. So this used to be the way to really get to the deep interior, the deep recesses of the Blue Ridge Tunnel. And that's what we did back in 2017, a number of times crawling to the inside to sort of map it. But um, fortunately, it's now been open to the public and it's much easier to see the great glory that is on the inside of the tunnel. The view you have, I hope, in front of you is, is sort of an oblique view in, uh, of a digital elevation model. The little town of Afton is here, the east trailhead, hopefully you can see, and then this is the rail trail. And the entrance to the tunnel is right there. It's kind of that dark rectangular spot that hopefully my laser pointer is is, is over. And it's a few hundred feet below the crest of Rockfish Gap. And basically the tunnel drives through the Blue Ridge for about 1400, I'm sorry, over 4,000 feet. And that was what we wanted to sort of study. In fact, it was a, a tremendous opportunity to be able to be beneath the surface, sort of seeing what is there. 
And it turns out that the rock that is, um, the tunnel is primarily cut through is in the Catoctin Formation, which I mentioned just a tad earlier. And here is our cross section of the tunnel. So all of the green rock here is greenstone. See how that works? Green, greenstone. And the tunnel slices through the mountain right here, pops out over on the Augusta County side. Much of the tunnel, there's actually a lot of brickwork, and uh, that's actually a consequence of the underlying bedrock. Um, much of the eastern part of the tunnel is solid, strong, foliated greenstone. But as we get further into the tunnel, um, we end up in a variety of other rock types, some of which are sedimentary or metasedimentary, and they're mechanically less stable, they're uh, prone to collapse, and effectively they engineered up a, a, a brick wall to keep it from collapsing. And it's kind of stood the test of time, more than 150 years old. What's cool is that when you're in the tunnel, at one point under Scott Mountain, you've got 700 feet of rock above you, all right? So when you're next there, think about what is above you. Um, and the other thing that we discovered in our mapping of the tunnel is what we call the Hall of Budens. And you may be saying, hmm, what is that? Well, let me show you a picture from the Hall of Budens. So this is my head for scale. You can see the back of my head and uh, rock hammer. And this is what the interior of the tunnel looks like. It's interesting, part of the interior of the tunnel, the greenstone ended up with a patina on it that uh, actually turned it sort of a yellowy brown. Um, but if you whack on it, it will break and you'll then see that it actually is, is greenstone. But I hope you also notice some of these other structures here. And these structures, which I've outlined in pink, are actually layers or bits of sandstone, metamorphosed sandstone that's been altered that are caught between the layers of greenstone. And we call these things budins because they are oftentimes isolated, little sort of sausage lumps that have greenstone surrounding them. So here's one that I'm outlining. There's a spectacular one here that's quite asymmetric, another one up there. And so you may be saying, what in the world is that? Well, these are geologic structures. And if you were in my Earth Structure and Dynamics course, what you would get is this slide at some point where we work through both the definition of what a budin or boudinage is, um, and we talk about how they actually form. Typically, they're stronger structures that are embedded in weaker rock. And as those rocks are sheared and deformed, they are pulled apart into these shapes that we know as boudins. Um, my favorite description of it is actually from Callan Bentley, who is a William Mary geology graduate. And um, I'm going to highlight that. And Callan, could you unmute for a minute and maybe show us how to pronounce uh, this word? Well, you've already pronounced it. But uh, in, in terms of the way I've described it here, I'd say boudinage. Absolutely. That is the best way to say it. A heavy French accent, uh, leering, um, and a dirty look. All of that is how we can say it. So boudinage is where it is at. If you want to see it, you should visit the Blue Ridge Tunnel. The other thing I will say about this is that this is a, a huge effort to get the Tunnel 1 open, and the fact that it's been made into a public space I think is remarkable and a testament to sort of the things that are good in the world, that we now have the ability to safely transit in and out of the tunnel. A few weeks ago, I was hit with this question. Why are the Blue Ridge Mountains so narrow north of the Wintergreen Resort? And the Wintergreen Resort is right there. I uh, stole their official icon. Some of you may be there, but if you didn't know where it is, do you know where it is now? Um, and let's think about this. The Blue Ridge Mountains do a very curious thing in this location. To the north of Wintergreen, towards Rockfish Gap, the range is only three or four miles wide. Yet, as you get further south into the Thai River region, the range expands to 10, 12 kilometers, I'm sorry, 10, 12 miles wide in some points. So why is that? Why is the range narrow in one place and broad in the other? This is an important thing when you think about it, because if you think about um, mountain ecosystems, if you are narrowing down the width of the mountain belt, species that live in that highland zone now actually have a much smaller area to transit than they would otherwise. And we certainly know that between the National Forest and the National Park, much of the Blue Ridge Highlands is sort of currently preserved as mostly natural ecosystems. Kind of the, the critical piece here is big levels. Some of you may notice that or know of it, but it's, it's part of the, the corner here in the mountain range. And it's kind of this high massif, it's fairly flat up on the top of it, which is kind of, I think, where the name came from. Um, and it's part of the story. So let me see if I can answer that question for you. Here's a geologic map of that same region. 
And the green rock is part of the Catoctin Formation. The light blue rocks here are the older granitic basement rocks. And then out in the Shenandoah Valley are younger rocks, all right? These are still old rocks, but they're the youngest kind of in our drama here. But the other thing I want you to uh, notice is that the mountain range itself is actually bounded by a fault. And this is what we call the Blue Ridge Fault. And there are, in fact, two strands of it that we can see here that don't quite match up. The other thing I'll point out on here is the Rockfish Valley Fault Zone. Peter said I needed to talk about it. Um, I actually did much of my PhD research trying to understand the Rockfish Valley Fault Zone. And it is another major structure that we see in uh, Nelson County and in the Blue Ridge. So let's put this into a cross-section view. Geologists like to take time to think about what does stuff look like in the third dimension. So this cross-section is gonna be from the edge of big levels over Devil's Knob and then down into the Rockfish Valley. And at least in my mind's eye, this is what um, the geologic structure would look like. The Rockfish Valley is a fault zone. In fact, the valley is well developed in here and it's quite wide. It's some kilometer two or three miles wide. And that's in contrast to the Blue Ridge Fault, which is oftentimes a set of much narrower faults. Um, to give you a, a sense of the geology, the old basement rock is, is stippled and in kind of this light lavender color. Um, the greenstone is in what color? It's in the greenstone. Yeah, it's green. And then some of the younger strata out here as we move over towards big levels. So these are part of the important structures we see in this part of the Blue Ridge. One of the interesting things is these two fault zones are very different. The rocks in the Rockfish Valley Fault were hot enough that when they were being deformed, they were actually being sheared and smeared. if you like to put cream cheese on bagels, that's a good word. Um, and so they've been transformed into rocks we call myelonites. And that happened under great pressures and at great depth. And that's in contrast to the deformation structures we see along the Blue Ridge Fault. These are much more brittle. It looks like the rocks were ground and shattered as one part of the fault system sort of dragged other material with it. So you see a whole different style of deformation along these faults. And it also turns out we think that these faults are different in age by about 50 million years. So that the Rockfish Valley Fault Zone is older and occurred when the rocks were at greater depth and the Blue Ridge Fault when they were at a shallower depth. So the Blue Ridge has got faults that bound it here and here, but why do we have this big bend in the whole mountain range there? And I think the best way to think about that is this three-dimensional block diagram. And the rocks of the Shenandoah Valley are in pink, and they're in pink on this block diagram. And what I've tried to do is, is illustrate a three-dimensional shape to the Blue Ridge Fault. And what you'll notice is that there are ramps where the rocks were basically thrust up over and we have a, a long ramp system here near Waynesboro. And we have another long ramp system that goes from sort of north of Vesuvius all the way into Rockbridge County. And then at big levels, there is a step over in that fault. And the structural geologists would say that is a lateral ramp. And so in essence, we have two components of a family of faults, but they're not lined up. There's actually a gap between them. And that is part of the reason why the mountain range steps over so dramatically there. It's cool to think about. If you were to go to big levels, you would actually drill a hole through the old rocks and eventually you would end up in the younger rocks that are actually out in the Shenandoah Valley, all right? So that's a uh, part of the sort of thing that can be mind blowing when you open your mind to geology. So the Blue Ridge rocks were transported sort of the way the arrows just went from the Southeast up and over this set of structures. And that is part of the architecture in central Virginia. So one of the things that my team of students has been doing is we've been trying to make maps um, that can be useful at a variety of um, scales and purposes in Nelson County. And here is the Rockfish River watershed. And of course the Rockfish drains, sort of starts the North Fork up here at uh, Rockfish Gap. Um, you can pick Devil's Knob or Three Ridges as kind of the location of the South Fork. And I'm interested in, in hearing from you, how can we make maps that would be you know, valuable to the public, um, about this sort of region. One of the things that comes out of this is that watersheds are connected and the water that sort of dribbles onto the Blue Ridge or comes cascading down ultimately flows through that whole system and onto the James River at Howardsville. 
part of what we've done is we've taken some very precise topographic data and we've created these profiles of the South Fork and the North Fork and then the main stem of the rockfish. And we'd like to turn those into um, things that you could pull up on your phone at a particular location and say, hey, the gradient of the river here is this. Um, and while we're on this, I'm gonna throw a, a zinger at you here. Why does the Rockfish River have this profile? We call this profile a concave up profile. So it's very steep in the headwaters. And as we get closer and closer to Howardsville, generally the river gradient becomes less and less. Um, yeah, I can give you some time to think about that. Um, but it is one of the characteristics of many, many uh, stream systems that they have this classic profile to them. So I'll let that hang out there for a little bit. I'm not gonna answer this question at all. Um, but maybe we'll come back to it in the Q&A. The other thing I would say is I'm very excited about sort of coming to Nelson and being in Nelson and enjoying the Rockfish River. It is a spectacular river system. Um, we've worked with the Rockfish Valley Foundation already, thinking about trying to understand things. So here's a, a photo on the left of my uh, field methods class. And there's a Chip Morgan out there in the distance looking at the South Fork. Um, and then on the right is clearly a pre-COVID research canoe trip on the main stem of the Rockfish River. How many William Mary students can you pack into a canoe and not actually sink it? But it's a lovely watershed. And one of the things that I have uh, heard is that uh, Nelson has now obtained funds to put in a proper sort of boat landing, um, which I think will be great for getting people onto the river. Um, so I'm very excited about that. The next place I'd like to take us to is in the eastern part of the county. I'd like to go to Schuyler for a little while. And it turns out when I was a graduate student, I did my graduate work at Johns Hopkins University, and I would come down to study rocks in the Blue Ridge, and sometimes I would stay at my Uncle Joe's place. And Uncle Joe lived just a little bit to the west of Schuyler. And after long, hard days of field work, I'd come back to Joe's place, and um, sometimes we'd go swimming. Yeah, we would go to some of these old soapstone quarries and uh, take some beers, as you might imagine, and uh, swim in those quarries. And so it's kind of uh, satisfying now. Back in the 1990s, I didn't think I would ever be interested in those kinds of rocks. But here we are, 2021, and uh, soapstone has become kind of one of our areas of research. Soapstone is uh, a useful rock. And here are a few images of Virginia soapstone um, being put to use. Kitchen countertop here, and then a very large stone eagle with uh, it needs its toes clipped, um, sitting guarding kind of the front of the Johnstown, Pennsylvania post office. And these were from soapstone deposits that were quarried in Schuyler, Virginia. Here's a photo that Candace Clark gave to me. And Candace works for the company that is currently um, quarrying this. And this is from the good old days of Schuyler, back when they employed literally hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, some of these buildings are still there. You can see these massive quarries, these ginormous derricks that they had to hold and hoist out the rock. And what I love about these old photos, if you really start to look at them, there's lots to be seen. So if you can follow my laser pointer, you see these darker areas right here? That is actually where there's water in the rock. And those are fractures. And the fractures are conduits for groundwater. And that's bad for the quarry person because they don't want fractures. But for those of us who think about structure, it's like you can see the regularity of those fractures in here and it's just really cool. So what is soapstone? Well, soapstone is primarily a rock that's composed of the mineral talc and then a handful of other minerals. So in this instance, the, the sort of shreddy looking stuff that's not as colorful as a mineral called serpentine. And it is an igneous rock or we think it is an igneous rock that was metamorphosed at some point and greatly altered. These rocks are very low in silica and high in magnesium. And although the rocks at Schuyler have been quarried for you know 150 years, uh, no one really is sure about their geologic age and exactly how did those bodies form. And so from the scientific point of view, that's why we're interested in these. Um, can we answer those questions about what is the age and what is the origin of these sort of interesting rocks? And I'm hoping we can do that. So Polycore is a French, Canadian, American, company that runs Dimension Stone quarries. And we have partnered with them uh, as they explore their resources. Um, and what they have done earlier this year is they have drilled about 2,000 feet of new rock core. And we are going to analyze the core for them. Their objective is one, to find interesting soapstone that they can sell to people, maybe people coming to Nelson County. 
And my objective is to use this rock core to answer a set of scientific questions we've never been able to answer before. So I think it'll be a great partnership. We also kind of want to highlight sort of the, the whole company town, how Skylar sort of rose and fell, and hopefully it can continue in a positive way forward. So the cores themselves are fabulous. Um, it, it is really sort of like Christmas morning every time I get to go look at these rock cores um, that were obtained there. So you can see a little bit of the rock core. Logging thousands of feet of it is a little more of a flaw, but maybe a year on we'll have a, a good story to tell about Skylar. Okay, let's move to the southern part of the county. We're going to go to Gladstone. And Gladstone is a small town, uh, it was a railroad town on uh, the CNO and now the CSX. And this is in some ways a, a picture that makes me sad. Um, it's a picture that I took almost a year ago today. And I took this on a William Mary geology field trip where we had 45 students. It's a voluntary field trip. The students were leading the field trip. So in purple, this is Emily Henshaw who graduated from William Mary last year. But the reason this is a bit of a sad photo is this was the very last sort of uh, normal field trip. This was kind of right on the cusp of when uh, the world went to a different place. And, uh, but we were all there and you can see social distancing was not in our vocabulary. But one of the things that's difficult to see is the rock because there were so many of us. So here's a better view, same vantage point of that. And you'll notice there's a lot of rock, these round dark bits of rock sticking out here in front of the church. In fact, we call this the church of the Holy Diabase. And that's not exactly what they call it, but I think that would be a wise name, the Church of the Holy Diabase. There is no other outcrop of Diabase that is as nice that I know of in the state of Virginia. Um, so you might wonder, what the heck is Diabase? Well, Diabase is, uh, well, this is a, a microscopic view of it, and it's got a classic texture for an igneous rock, these interlaying, inter um, woven minerals, if you will, they're interlocking, um, different minerals like feldspar, uh, pyroxene, and it's an igneous rock. It cooled from a magma. Um, typically, diabase is enriched in iron and calcium. And the thing about the diabase, these are among the very youngest rocks we see in the Piedmont and the Blue Ridge. Um, so I would put it out there as among the youngest, no, I think I just said the youngest rocks in Nelson County. So my team of students mapping in the Gladstone region identified a set of these uh, diabase uh, exposures. And you can see they crop out here and they're the red lines that you see on the geologic map. They are very linear and fairly straight. And they are, again, younger rocks that intruded into much older rocks. So the older rocks would be in the blue or the brown or the green. Um, and it turns out the diabase dikes in Nelson County occur in a, in a fairly clear pattern. So Gladstone is down here in the south, but we can trace some of these dikes almost straight to the north, and many of them end up being very near or just to the east of Rockfish Gap. In three dimensions, this is what we think this looks like. So you have a diabase, we call them dikes because they are narrow, thin fins of this younger igneous rock intruded into the older rocks. And at some point, 198 to 200 million years ago, the Earth's crust in Nelson County and much of the eastern part of North America was under stress and the rocks cracked and magma was injected or intruded. So when I see a map pattern like this, what this is telling me is the rocks went book and you injected magma into them under some kind of tectonic stress. So this is what I might argue is sort of the great dike system of Nelson County. It flourishes down here near Gladstone. Um, we don't see nearly as many of these as we move further to the west and there are fewer still out to the east. And actually these dikes may play a role in actually the landscape. Um, as I said, a lot of these dikes are very close and they cross the Blue Ridge in the very narrow part of the mountain range. Islands in the stream. Anybody know uh, who sings that song? I'm not gonna ask people to unmute and sing it. Um, I think it's a Dolly Parton, um, Kenny Rogers affair, but it was actually written by uh, Barry Gibb of the Bee Gees. And uh, during quarantine, I've been trying to get my hair to do a little bit of the, the Barry Gibbs stuff. I think another month or two, I should be right there. And it's a fabulous song and it inspires me because this is a photo of two islands in the James River. And this is a photograph taken from a drone image, but you can see the river wrapping around and through these islands. And these islands in the river, islands in the stream, are very interesting landforms. 
So here is uh, an image, <clears throat> Gladstone is, is shown over there, and a very prominent set of islands in this part of uh, Nelson County on the James are the Smith Islands. Now, when I was uh, a wee lad, my Boy Scout troop from Crozet, Virginia would go down there and we would camp, we would canoe camp and stay right here on the Smith Islands. Um, it turns out we were a little too young to be drinking much beer, but we certainly try. Um, the other thing I learned on the Smith Islands as a Boy Scout was never ever go on a snipe hunt. Um, and I understand that snipe is a type of bird. And I think the experiences I had on these Boy Scout snipe hunts meant that I was never destined to be an ornithologist. But uh, the Smith Islands are these interesting flattish islands in the middle of the river. And let's look at them with a bit of modern technology. So here is a, a map made by effectively laser, and we call it LIDAR, in which we can basically make very detailed topographic maps at a scale that were, was really not, we weren't capable of doing this even a decade, 15 years ago. And so I've color coded this. So the purples are lower elevation, the reds are higher elevation, and then everything that's out of the way here is, is, is kind of in white. But you get a very striking uh, pattern on these islands, which are sitting in the middle of the river. Now let's look at that in the third dimension here. So I'm gonna give you a cross-section view along this line. And if we move to the cross-section view, it looks something like this. So here are the Smith Islands and they sit up about 15 to 20 feet above the river channel. Um, and so this is just the terrain where the channels are, where the islands are. Let's put a little bit of the geology on there. And in this part of the geologic system, there are only two things that are important. Count them, two, one, two. The first is the bedrock, which is underlying. I've got it illustrated here in purple. And the James River sort of bevels off the bedrock. But on top of that is sediment. We call it alluvium that is pushed around and deposited by the river. And the Smith Islands are actually underlain by sand and gravel and silt, just as you would see on the floodplain on either side. So that's kind of the 3D structure of the Smith Islands. So I want to ask you, how in the world did the Smith Islands form? And I've got two models here. One is that at some point in the past, the James River, the James River, flowed around the outside in the channel that I've just illustrated there. And we had a floodplain on one side of the river and a floodplain on the other side of the river. And at some point, at some point, for some reason, the James decided to take a shortcut through its own floodplain. All right, maybe it was a high water event. But in essence, the river takes a shortcut and now we have two channels and you've created the Smith Islands by jumping the inside track on that channel. So that would be one model, but you could probably sit at home and say, well, wait a minute, Jeff. why not another model? Maybe we have a situation where the inner channel is actually the original or older channel and an event occurs in which the James is forced to take a wide detour and we form the Smith Islands by isolation that way, all right? Um, Two summers ago, I made all my undergraduate researchers paddle around, first circumnavigation of the Smith Islands. So we had to paddle upstream for about a mile and a half to go around them, debating which channel was older, the outside or the inside. And um, I, have my, uh, I have my ideas about it, um, and I think it's actually pretty clear, but these are the kind of landscape questions that are fun to tackle. The other thing that's interesting is if you look back at aerial photos, you'll notice that um, this is a 1946 photo the rail yard in Gladstone was kind of going full tilt. I think a lot of these are coal cars that are sitting there with West Virginia coal getting shipped, um, probably getting ready to be shipped to the war effort. Um, the other thing you'll notice is the islands, which today are covered in vast forest, big trees, was being cultivated at that point in time. And so this is the end of the Smith Islands. We'll compare that to a 1994 photo, all right? It's still in black and white, it should be at the same scale. And hopefully if you're not asleep or haven't uh, sort of faded off the call, you'll notice that something is missing. And what is missing are these little bits of alluvial island right here and right here. So in the 50 year-ish interval between the 40s and the 90s, some of these islands were completely removed. So to me, these are very dynamic systems where they can be formed possibly in a variety of ways. And then they have the you know, fate of over time um, being eroded away. So how stable are they as landforms and ecosystems? So this is what we sort of learned and thought about um, in the Smith Islands. Part of our research along the James has been done with uh, ROVs or drones. And it's pretty fun to fly. Uh, 
these. Uh, usually I'm kind of the show manager. So I have other people who do the flying and uh, stuff like that, but we can get a lot of information by repeat photography. So on your right are two drone images of the same spot on the James River near Gladstone taken uh, at different times of the year. And there are different things to see. And for those who like bedrock geology, hopefully you'll notice that low water, you get a lot of rocks that are exposed. Okay, we've got one more spot on our tour of Nelson County. And I'd like to go to Massey's Mill and talk to you a bit about the 1969 Camille disaster. This is an aerial photo um, that Dick Whitehead passed on to me, and there is a lot to be seen here. And in our sort of <clears throat> exploration of Massey's Mill, we're gonna start in downtown, then we're gonna move uptown, and then we're gonna finish out in the sticks, all right? So three different spots here in Massey's Mill. So here's the downtown image, zoomed in from that same picture. That was taken just a few days after Hurricane Camille. And there's a lot to see in this image. There's a lot in this image I don't understand. Um, but if we annotate it, it might have more value. So here is the Grace Episcopal Church, which sits um, in downtown Massey's Mill. Tanyard Road, actually the bridge washed out, completely gone, bye-bye. It was one of a multitude of bridges that were washed out by Camille along um, Route 56 and uh, nearby. And then there are things I don't understand. There's this curious sort of accordion shaped thing there. I, anyway, someone may know. But let's take a look at Grace Episcopal Church. Um, this is a, a sort of a famous landmark. And the church was flooded. They lost their Bible. It went all the way down the river to the James. Um, but we know, based on the staining, exactly how high the floodwaters in August 1969 reached. And this is a, an image um, <clears throat> from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And I was there last week and took this picture. And so this is what I think is really a nice touchstone where you have structures and things that were there, saw it, and are now still here with us. But while I was standing there, I was struck with the question, we know how high the water was, but how fast was it flowing? So I hope you'll stick with me for a few minutes and we can come up with an answer for that. And to get to that answer, we've got to sort of dig into the historical archive. There's a, a, a basically publication uh, put out by the Water Resources Division of the USGS on the flood of 1969. Here's another view of the Ty River at Norwood where uh, the road was washed out, uh, the railroad bridge was badly damaged. And let me just throw out there a, a thought question. If you were to imagine the stream drainage discharge, how much water was flowing down individual rivers, the James River, the Ty River, Cove Creek, you might say, well, you know, I would predict drainage basin area, that is how big the watershed is, would be a function of how much discharge, or maybe I should say that the other way around. The bigger the drainage basin, the more water, so that the James River would carry more water than uh, Little Spruce Creek. And here are the data from the James River Basin. These were estimates that were made for the peak of the flood, and there are about 75 data points on here. And lo and behold, the big rivers, like the James, carries much more water and discharge than the little rivers. It's good when science works that way, the intuitive part. So let's put a little wrinkle on this. And the little wrinkle is we're gonna keep the drainage basin size down here on the x-axis. And notice it's logarithmic, so we can go from teeny weeny to very large, all right? But what I've plotted now on the y-axis is the discharge per area. We would say the normalized discharge. So how much water came down the stream for every unit of landscape? Okay, so we're gonna divide by the area size. So would you predict that there would be a relationship here? Do you think the really big rivers would have huge amounts of flow relative to the area? Or would it be diluted a little bit because it's such a big area? Um, well, Let's keep it moving along, Chuck, right? So these are the data. And one of the things that you can see is the big rivers, and all of these data points are off of the main stem of the James River, have lower discharges per unit area. And the reason is that, well, they were collecting water over a much larger region, and the whole region did not actually all receive high precipitation. So these were little tiny streams that had quite a bit of water that came down them. And then we get over here, and what are these? These are streams that are bigger and also had a ginormous amount of water. So let's see which streams these are. This is the discharge per area at Massey's Mill. 
That is the discharge per area at Norwood, the mouth of the Tai River. And so hopefully this graph would give you a sense that the Tai River system, the rockfish as well, were really overperforming in the sense that they had huge amounts of water coming down relative to the size of the basin. So the Tai River is an order of magnitude, two orders of magnitude bigger than some of these small drainages, but there was still more water per area flowing through there, which is why they had a ginormous flood. Okay, back to Massey's Mill. We've got this question to answer. Um, here's a LIDAR map from Massey's Mill. It's color coded. There's the Episcopal Church. And the reason I put this in here is with the LIDAR data, we can create very detailed topographic cross sections. So here is a detailed cross section of effectively modern Massey's Mill. Here's the Tai River, where it sort of generally is. And that's where the Tai River was during the Camille flood. And we know that from the data at the church. So we're getting much closer to actually having an answer here. We can calculate the discharge of a stream, cubic feet per second, so that's a unit we would use, by knowing the area of the channel, as well as the average velocity of the stream flow. And actually that's what we're really interested in. And it turns out we actually have values for the area of the channel, as well as the discharge. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers estimated the discharge at Massey's Mill, all right? And from our LIDAR data, I counted the boxes and figured out that was the area of the stream. So now we just have to do a little bit of arithmetic. Sorry to make you do arithmetic on a uh, lovely Sunday afternoon. And we end up with an average velocity right there. And that's the average of about four and a half miles per hour. So four and a half miles per hour. If you're in a canoe, that would be booking it pretty good. Um, but you know, it doesn't sound that impressive, four and a half miles an hour. But that is what kind of comes out of this. But I would argue that four and a half miles per hour, and especially if you've got five, six, eight feet of water flowing at that rate can do a great deal of um, damage. And if we move to uptown Massey's Mill, I think you'll get a sense of that. Here's a photograph taken from uh, the middle of Route 56 looking to the south. And what do you notice in the middle of Route 56? That's right, very good, very good. There are two houses in the middle of Route 56 sitting in the road. And that's not where those houses originated. This is back to the image that Dick gave me. And in this image, hopefully you can see that there's a house and a house, all right? And they're kind of catty corner up against each other. Um, so we're looking down on it. And these two structures originally were right here. And these structures were effectively ripped off their piers by the uh, floodwaters flowing at four or five miles an hour. And effectively they were transported to this location. Now I don't think they were transported as straight lines. One of the houses had to completely rotate and crash into the other. So that is the power of flowing water um, to remove wholesale buildings. And these are buildings that people were in. And of course, 22 people died in Massey's Mill because of that terrible flood. The other thing that to me, in looking at these old images, um, you'll notice here and here, that is a tree. In fact, it's a Norway spruce that was planted. Um, and the house came to rest up against the trunk of that tree. And um, whether the house would have gone further, I don't necessarily know. But here's a photo I took just a few days ago in Massey's Mill, looking along Route 56 and the center line. And that old spruce tree is still there. And it's lost its top over time. But to me, that's another touchstone, something that was there over 50 years ago in Nelson County, which is still there. And in some ways, if you know, if the tree could talk, it has seen a lot of uh, history. Okay, we're getting close to the end here, folks. Um, so this is the last part of our Massey's Mill tour. And what you'll notice in this is an aerial photograph. And in the upper right-hand corner, the northeast corner, this is F.K. Whitehead's orchard um, that was there in 1969. And if you look closely, you'll notice that there is some sediment that is coming out in a variety of places. And this is sediment that was mobilized by debris flows and avalanches that came off of the top of this hill. And some of this sediment came out to the orchard. Some of it didn't slide very far. Um, these were not the biggest or most impressive debris slides in Nelson County, but they did happen. And uh, they happened right here on the edge of Massey's Mill. It turns out this is the piece of property that we just purchased. And we're gonna call it Blue Quartz Hill. Um, we're excited about that. There's a lot of blue quartz there. 
Um, we're also excited because we do want to basically um, plant apples and bring back FK Whitehead's orchard. And hopefully that can be a possibility in the next few years. The other thing that's exciting about this is that we have some riverfront footage on the tie, frontage on the tie. And we really want to turn this kind of into sort of a, a research station, a place where people can go to study the environment, the geology, the river. Um, I'm also excited because uh, this is the curved bridge on Route 56 um, that actually we have land on both sides of here. And my wife has suggested if I continue to go sideburns and hair like this, that I should think about going to live under that bridge in Massey's Mill. Um, so who knows? It's a fine bridge. I'll tell you that. It was one of the ones that actually stood up through uh, the Camille flood. So I'm looking forward to sort of being in Nelson and being a good neighbor. So you've been patient with me. We visited five places in Nelson County. We could have visited more. Um, there's sort of a story to tell in all of these. And there's a timeline for geologic history, and it's all right here, more than you want me to read to you. One of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to basically post this presentation as a static PDF file and uh, make sure that people can go download that so you can see all of this and you can read about Appalachian orogenies and uh, the deposition of the Lynchburg group at your own time. But Nelson preserves a long, long geologic history. The other thing is I hope you think a little bit about the time scale of geologic processes because there are processes like the initiation of a debris flow or a landslide that might happen instantaneously or nearly instantaneously. There are other things that are more seasonal like droughts which have a big impact on the landscape. But how long do other things take to happen? Well, the life cycle of fault might be a million years or so. So the Blue Ridge Fault may have been active for a million years, two million years, something like that. Whereas climate cycles, glacial cycles, which impact the flora and the fauna and the landscape occur at a smaller time scale. So process and time are sort of an integral part of geology. And that's one of the things I think is very cool about it. So I'm gonna leave you with this final slide. Um, and then we're gonna take questions. If you guys still have any, uh, if you sort of still up for that, I haven't worn you out completely. So from my perspective, Nelson County has a spectacular geologic heritage and it's one that we ought to advertise and promote um, and, you know, the thing that I think is a great connection is geology is a science in which time and place matter. And I tried to make those connections evident today during the talk. I hope you also are going to leave thinking that geology is more than rocks. You know, I study rocks, but I'm interested in landscape and water, um, the environment. And that geology leads to the environment. And that also has a direct bearing on the human condition. And then the final point is, I think there's a lot we can still learn uh, about the geology in Nelson County and beyond. And as I said, I hope that the We Mary Geology team can be good partners with uh, people in Nelson over the next few years as we learn about it and then sort of uh, report about the geology. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Callan and hopefully we'll be able to moderate some questions. I'm going to stop screen sharing right now. Uh, let's see, I'm going to get out of that. Okay, great uh, talk, Chuck. Thank you very much. I'm sure if everybody was unmuted, you'd be able to hear uh, amazing applause, like thunder. Um, thunder. Thank you very much. Uh, so um, I want to just remind everybody that uh, the chat is down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It looks like a little cartoon word bubble. And if you click on that, there's a space there where you can just briefly type uh, a summary of what you want to ask Chuck about. And I'll try and organize questions into uh, themes. Uh, so one thing I was wondering about Chuck is about these really cool uh, diabase outcrops uh, in Gladstone. Um, and um, you know, they were really impressive. Um, showed the cool map of the dikes as well. And um, Marilyn, it looks like, um, uh, was keying into something I was noticing too. Marilyn noted that there's a, an almost 90 degree relationship between the orientation of those dikes and the faults that you uh, were talking about. Um, would you care to comment on the reason for that and perhaps tie those dikes into tectonic history? I will certainly try. So one of the things we've got to remember is that these dikes are much, much younger than, than all the other rocks that are out there. And they formed at a time we call the Mesozoic. And really we think that they were forming as the Atlantic Ocean was being birthed, if you will. And that, inv that involved a, a, a lot of tectonic monkey business. And one element of that was the injection of these um, dikes into the crust. And they were injected in, a, in an orientation that was probably related to the direction that the stress was focused on the crust. And so at that point in time, the crust was basically about to be pulled apart. And I say that sort of in air quotes here. And that's in contrast to the older faults when those faults formed, the Rockfish Valley Fault or some of the faults that we have in Gladstone, 
basically this part of North America would have been under contraction where the stresses were almost at 90 degrees and they were basically pushing on the crust. So two different geologic structures formed at different times where the stress system has basically been rotated by at least 90 degrees. So I would argue that's kind of the rationale and reason for it, but that's a very good observation. Okay, um, we also had a question um, from uh, Kate Humphrey, who is um, curious about soils. Kate, do you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question? There we go. Hey, Chuck, uh, Hi, read a lot of history and then just, I, I just think it's so clever that these early surveyors like Peter Jefferson, Thomas's father, was, uh, they were looking out for good uh, uh, plantation or farmland for themselves, but they'd also hawk that information to people who were looking to leave the tidewater and come to this wilderness. Uh, some of the best plantations that were financially successful were on the Catoctin in that Eastern branch of it that uh, is at the surface. How did they determine the quality? How did, how were they able to pick out the soil quality that was, uh, that, that came from Catoctin? Okay, that's a, that's a great question. And a, another one of these, you know, absolute connections between sort of history, people, um, and geology. So the Catoctin formation is, um, it's kind of rich in a lot of different elements, all right? And uh, some of those are calcium, a little bit of magnesium, and it certainly has a lot of iron. And all of these are nutrients, if you will, for plants and forests. So originally, sort of prior to sort of colonization, um, the, the forest distribution, the, the ecology on the Catoctin probably would have been a little more diverse, more species, just because it had access to things like calcium and magnesium at a much higher uh, level in the soils than you would on other rocks like quartzite or rocks like schist, which are much, much lower in things like calcium. You end up with soils that are much more acidic, a little less buffered. So um, I think that once you started planting on those sort of reddish Catoctin soils, you probably were getting bigger yields and that probably didn't take too long for people to figure out. Um, I think at the time they weren't sure why, you know, the crops grew better here versus there but it has a lot to do with the rock chemistry and then how that is translated into the soils that are created on top of that. Does that apply to the vineyards today that are trying to find the right place? I see Andrew Hodson is on this, this call. I, um, <clears throat> in some ways it should. I mean, you would think that, um, you know, if you have two different rock types, two different soils, that that may have an influence on, um, you know, grapes, and the question becomes, you know, do you want to have grapes that are growing in a luxurious soil or would you rather stress them out um, and stuff like that? And then, you know, I think, and this goes for um, a lot of different plants and I'm hopefully going to soon learn about this. Um, you know, I think the climate is hugely important and the micro topography is important. Um, the soils are at some level, but a lot of times I think plants are able to deal with that. Um, but, you know, there are certain places to be and certain places not to be. And I think in Virginia, you know, to me, it seems like the climate is one of the big challenges, um, as much so as, you know, the particular soil. Can I ask a question? Um, uh, I, this is Andrew Hodson. I own the vineyard at the top of, um, at, on, at, at, at Afton. Um, and we consider that the, the soil is called Edney Town. Are you familiar mm -hmm. with Edney Town? It's meant to be a degenerate granite. Yep. That's, that's a good way to describe it, a degenerate granite. Um, indeed so, yeah. So that, that vineyard is in a spectacular spot. Um, and those rocks are the rocks that are right below the Catoctin formation. So they probably are a little less iron and calcium rich in the soil. There's still plenty of iron. I would suspect that, you know, they're, they're still a, a ruddy orange color. Um, and because on that slope, they should be quite well drained. Um, that would be my sort of first inference and I certainly have driven around both sides of it but um, haven't been sort of up there but this will be uh, on the list. Thank you very much. We have a very high iron content in our water. Um, uh, one, of a one of our problems is the amount of iron um, when we're using ozone. Uh, the iron neutralizes ozone um, which we use to for cleaning the, uh, the barrels and things like that but uh, mm -hmm. thank you for your insights. Well, that's that. I grew up west of Charlottesville, sort of between Ivy and Crozet, and the well on 
that property had enough iron in it as well. And it was not in the Catoctin formation. It was in, in part of the, the basement complex. But, you know, eventually we needed filters and things like that um, because, you know, over time it would really become an issue. Several people have put comments in the chat about uh, wanting Chuck to take a look at uh, a rock you found or ideas about the watershed maps. And since those aren't um, particular like, you know, information gathering questions to ask from Chuck, I think I'm gonna go to, to the other ones. Like uh, one person asked uh, for uh, an explanation of Nelsonite. Ah, uh, Nelsonite. I actually have a slide about Nelsonite. Um, but how about we, you wanna see the slide about Nelsonite? Let's do it. I'm sure we do. Let's do it. Let's see. All right, I'm gonna, and this will be quick. Like I said, I promised Nelsonite and I realized I hadn't quite delivered. So, look at that. Do people see Nelsonite now? Yay? Okay. So Nelsonite is what I would say a curious igneous rock. And you know we really have uh, Larry and the PVCC crew to thank for making it famous um, in the 21st century. And it's an igneous rock, so it crystallized from a, a melt, very hot. Um, but what it contains is very unusual. It ends up with a lot of uh, basically just two minerals, and these minerals are apatite and ilmenite. And they're both uh, minerals that have silicon in it and oxygen, but they have loads and loads of both titanium and phosphorus in them. And that is a very unusual combination. I mean, titanium and phosphorus are not even in the big eight elements. But this was mine because you could basically quarry it for titanium. And it turns out in the Roseland area, there are probably a dozen or so dikes and other bodies of uh, intrusive Nelsonite. And it's sort of localized just to that. And they're quite old. I mean, these are over a billion years in age. And they're part of the basement complex. But they are an extraordinarily unusual magma. And the thought is that this stuff in the magma didn't get along with any of the other stuff in the magmas. And they had to separate. They became sort of this immiscible liquid, sort of an oil and water thing. And then as they froze, you had these little patches of this rock that is greatly enriched in the dark black ilmenite and the lighter colored apatite. We are currently trying to figure out if we can date, determine the, the age of these big fat apatites, which are in there. So, um, there you go. That's my uh, Nelsonite slide. Excellent. Okay, so a couple questions about the Rockfish Valley Fault. Um, one questioner wants to know where they can see it, whether there are outcrops in the valley or in the river. And then uh, another person has uh, raised the question of the relationship between the Rockfish Valley Fault and the Blue Ridge Fault, whether it's one continuous fault that was formed and later offset by tectonic action. Okay. Um, you guys are just winding me up. This is great. Lovely way to spend my Sunday afternoon. Um, there are places to see the Rockfish Valley Fault. And the next time that you travel over Brent Gap on 151, Nelson 151, baby, um, as you sort of leave Devil's Backbone um, and you head south to Brent Gap, which is about four or five curves up and at the top of the hill, all of those rocks that you see as you climb the hill are in the Rockfish Valley Fault Zone. Um, they are very well layered. I've heard people say, look at all that shale, because it looks layered like a, a sedimentary rock. But those are all myelinites. Um, and on some of the curves, if you were careful, you pro probably stop and look at them. Um, so that that's one place. There are two or three other locations um, in the Rockfish Valley where there are really very nice outcrops of myelinite. One is just a little bit east of Greenfield. Um, you know, there's that ginormous oak there, and then you can take the road back to the east. Um, you then cross the North Fork of the Rockfish, and there are little cliffs that are there uh, on the right side. And there's myelinite there. And then the other place I would say, um, if you are ever um, basically walking the trails, um, the trails that the Rockfish Valley Foundation has put in, if you do the big loop um, around sort of the Glenthorne Loop, on the south end of that, there's a little state road and the rocks along the edge of the road are really nicely exposed and they're part of that fault zone as well. So the second question was the Blue Ridge Fault and the Rockfish Valley Fault. 
we now think um, that those faults were not active at the same time. And probably what happened is that the Rockfish Valley Fault system formed um, <clears throat> 330, 350 million years ago, maybe 10 million years of sort of slow shearing and grinding of those rocks past each other. And then some 50 million years later, the, the Blue Ridge was still being squeezed, but these rocks had been uplifted. They were cooler. And in some places we can demonstrate that the Blue Ridge Fault truncated or cut through the Rockfish Valley Fault Zone. I can't show that to you in Rockfish Valley, but if you follow these zones far enough along in the Blue Ridge, you can find places near the James River Gorge, for instance, where the myelinites are truncated by these younger, more brittle faults. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting myself there. Um, okay, so I think I've got through everything people have typed in here. Let me just review here real quick. Um, yeah, I think we've covered everything that people have typed into the chat. So uh, here's an opportunity for folks to think of some other questions. Um, Chuck, one thing I was struck by was um, the uh, the old photo you showed of the, the quarries for the soapstone at Schuyler and you were pointing out the water flow sort of darkening the rock along a fracture set. Um, what's the relationship between those fractures and any possible expression in the modern day uh, drainage patterns? Are, are any of the, the small streams, for instance, controlled by fracture orientations? Um, well, thanks for that setup, Callan. I think that the, the answer would be the very small streams, kind of the first order streams, the little ones that have very little drainage basin area, oftentimes are parallel to the local fracture sets. Um, and, but as the stream system gets bigger and larger, that is more little drainages connect and you get a bigger stream, they tend to pay less attention to the, um, the fractures. So a big stream like the rockfish or the tie more or less flows along its way to the James River, which is, you know, the stream it's going to. And it is less influenced by the local structure. There are some examples that are interesting, but it's the little tiny streams where um, those streams don't have enough stream power. And so they're kind of taking advantage of whatever they're given in the bedrock, which is what they are having to remove. And it's easier to remove stuff parallel to a fracture commonly than it is across a fracture. The other thing that, that influences in the eastern side of Nelson County, the, the layers of rock are also turned on their side and some are harder than others. So that forms another element to the topography of these sort of ridges and then valleys. Um, it's subtle, but it's there. Okay, what if we took that in a chemical direction? There's a new question in the chat uh, about a relationship between the rocks and the water chemistry of the rivers that flow over them. Yeah. That's a, that would be another great um, thing to consider. And we have measured chemistries in, in um, Nelson County waters. And what's interesting is the water in the tie and the rockfish is, um, it is fairly low in dissolved elements like silicon and <clears throat> calcium and other things like that. But you step into the James River and all of a sudden it's loaded with stuff like calcium and bicarbonate. And that has everything to do with the rocks that it's flowing over. So most of the, the streams in Nelson County are flowing over granitic rocks or rocks that were derived from granite. And chemically, they're kind of meh. Uh, the green stones are different. Um, but what the James River brings is all of this water that originated in the Shenandoah Valley. And that carries with it lots and lots of dissolved elements like calcium, bicarbonate, and other things like that. So there is variability. And one of the things I'm curious about is if we look at a more detailed scale. Um, so one of the things we've discovered with the soapstone is that the soapstone actually has a fair bit of pyrite in it. And pyrite turns from fool's gold to sort of rust um, fairly quickly. And you can even see that in the old quarry walls. Um, how is that influencing the drainage systems there, the chemistry of it? And again, it's, it's natural. It was in the rock to begin with. So this is not an anthropogenic thing. Um, so I probably wiggled a little off tack there, Callan, but um, thank you for the largesse. Callan. Uh, yeah, Peter, you're up. If I can pull us together, uh, Andrew Hodson uh, represents 
some of the exciting production that's coming off of the Nelson County landscape. A goal of the Rockfish Valley Foundation is to take this committee, close to a dozen people, with people like Chuck and Callan and Kate and Lawrence, for us to be able to take, communicate, educate from the folks that are coming here to the wineries and the breweries and the cideries, to the kids that are coming up into the school system. That's why we've got the Natural History Center. There's a 75 pound block of Nelsonite as you go in the door of the Nelson County. And, about, a storyboard. and there's a storyboard all about it. We've got rocks that Chuck is uh, making sure that tell their story there. But we are building, you might call this the first step in an educational process that's going to take geology into tourism. So as we go forward, we will have partnerships with Veritas and other places where they will be connecting their visitors to the geology. And one of the exciting things, which Chuck and I talked about this week, is we think we've got a path to create an app which will work on a phone and give people the ability to know what's surrounding them. They can sit on 151 and point to something along the ridge, learn about it in different ways, geology as well as history and culture. So what you all have participated in today is our introduction of where we think we can take this excitement of agriculture, geology, culture, history, the wonderful products that are creating all the revenue for the county. This is really a beginning. So anybody who's got ideas, anybody who wants to be part, we think with Callan's support, we're gonna have another one of these uh, pretty soon. The geology committee today was looking at its future actions and responsibilities, uh, but we have a lot to thank Chuck mm. for letting us really get our feet on the ground. And he, he sold himself so much that he's now a property owner. So thank you, Chuck. Thank you, everybody who participated. Thank you, Geology Committee. Thank you, Betsy and the Natural History Center. Uh, thank you, Nelson County. Yay, team. Great. Well, thank you all. Um, I see one last thing here about QR codes for the Crozet Tunnel. And that's exactly on our list. We would like it to be uh, kind of modern and approachable. Um, so uh, that's a great point, John. Thanks for putting that there. But I want to thank you all for you know, taking your Sunday afternoon to kind of hang out with me. I hope I was not too terribly long-winded. Um, that's kind of an occupational hazard as a professor. But um, the last thing I will say is that I'm going to put together the presentation and then I will uh, put it online and I will make sure Peter and the powers that be actually have that link to get out to everyone. So you can again, download it and sort of study for the, the midterm exam on Nelson County geology and its heritage. So thank you. Thank you. And good day. Claps.